interesting to see the results of your survey there. Uh, moving on to uh, Dr. Rachel Roberts, who's from the Environment um, Partnership. Uh, and we'd also like to um, thank her for the very generous sponsorship of the student tickets to the conference this year. <laughs> So, uh, hi everybody. Um, so, I'm an um, associate ecologist at TUP. Um, right, which way are we going? So, um, for those of you who aren't aware, um, TUP's been in business for about 20 odd years. Uh, we started off in, um, not even in our own office, just a shared office in Warrington, and uh, we now have several offices across the country. Um, quite a large uh, quite a large number of staff covering many sectors. We're a multidisciplinary um, consultancy. Um, so we have quite a broad range of, of environmental sectors that we work in. Um, our ecology team in particular, we've got more than 30 in-house full-time ecologists now. So it's grown quite considerably in the last few years. Um, we're all members of SIEM or working towards uh, SIEM membership, various grades, which means that we apply standards and professional conducts um, throughout everything that we do. Um, our client base is quite varied. We have, um, obviously being a consultancy, it's largely planning driven, so we do have um, a high proportion of private developers, but we also work for the LPAs, NGOs, um, utilities firms, and that means that we do get to work on quite a wide variety of projects, um, housing, commercial, industrial, major infrastructure projects, um, down to, or up to, <laughs> depending on which way you look at it, um, more planning based options, appraisals, uh, spatial studies, that sort of thing. And we also have a reasonably good core of uh, non-planning related work as well. And um, our ecologists also provide ecological related advice to all of our other teams where that might be appropriate in their roles. So, <clears throat> I mean, you've just heard um, a little insight uh, for those of you who aren't necessarily familiar with the way that consultancies <coughs> use data, being the end user. Um, I, I, I didn't want to play too much on a standard desktop search. Um, it, it, now with uh, current standards, it is pretty much every report that goes in for planning that needs an, an ecology report will pretty much have to have a desktop search <coughs> with it. Um, I wanted to just have a little bit more of a behind the scenes in terms of how, how we use it, and in particular how useful we're finding MBN at the moment. Um, and the key thing for MBN at the minute is that it is accessible. There are some niggles depending on precisely what you want to use it for in terms of um, licenses or spatial scales. Um, but generally speaking, as, as an accessible tool, it is hugely useful. So um, some of the, the key benefits, uh, it can help with early identification before you've even set, on, set foot on site, or in some instances, if you're not even going to site. Um, the spatial range can be far more than you can cover in the field survey. And likewise, the, the time periods of data can be far more extensive than your one season or even one visit survey. So <clears throat> we can use these to reinforce our, our, our actual field surveys, hopefully giving us a much more comprehensive baseline, a more balanced approach, and helps us target when we're looking at impacts, mitigation, and recommendations, and hopefully getting a best possible outcome. So, these days, like I said, um, desktop data searches to accompany planning reports, pretty much standard. Um, but there are other ways that we use data, um, either for non-planning or behind the scenes in getting to producing that report. So preliminary assessment is, is key day to day. Um, and just as an example, in terms of a non-planning related, um, TEP has quite a a high portfolio of land management and property management, and it's very much um, geared towards public health and safety. So quite commonly, it's, it's a land agent that is looking after a derelict building or a bit of wasteland, old properties, 
they won't necessarily know about the risk of bats being in the building or Japanese knotweed growing down the side of a ditch or what have you. So our role there is to provide them with the necessary advice to make sure that what they're doing and what they're advising to the landowners is compliant. So having accessible data quickly that is also reasonably reliant, it, gives, it makes sure that we're providing the appropriate advice. And also, in terms of scoping for field surveys, um, most, to most consultants, scoping would be something that's um, quite a formal process, looking at EIA. But actually, from a consultant's perspective, one of the first things we've got to do when a client comes to us and says, I've got this site, what do we need to do? Well, we need to actually find out what they need to do. And the first point of call, almost invariable, will be NBN, aerial maps, and magic although there's now a lot of crossover between NBN and MAGIC in terms of, um, you can now look at um, protected sites on the NBN as well. So that helps us then identify what the likely interests might be, where the field surveys might need to be targeted, but also commercially, what that might cost. Are we gonna make sure that we can send the right <coughs> member of staff out with the right experience? And also looking at implications for project programmes as well. Most field surveys are seasonally constrained and we get a lot of out of season, can you just go and tell me what we need to do or we know planning, planning deadlines don't necessarily fall in with survey deadlines. So that helps us um, identify likely ecological interest. Um, given that we do do non-planning related work as well, what might be a risk to some? <laughs> could be an opportunity for others, and having accessible data again allows us to pick these up at an early, early point in the project. And then moving on, once we've, um, once we've got that sort of high level interest and we've, um, we've started our field surveys as well, the desktop data does actually have quite a lot of power in influencing and protection and mitigation measures. So taking, <coughs> taking the example in terms of the spatial extent, um, consultants virtually live and breathe by the red line, the dreaded red line. Data goes beyond that. So if you're looking at a mobile species, for example, and you're trying to work out how best to mitigate for that species, well, it's all very well looking at what's in the red line, but if it doesn't connect up with what's outside of your red line, it's not going to function, it's not going to work. And similarly, looking at the spatial range of data, it, the, the, having that wealth of desktop data available can be really helpful in terms of looking at possible biodiversity gains. One experience we've had quite recently is a, a huge um, arable site that we're working on in the south of England. And best will in the world, you can, buy, you can design a really fantastic sustainable development, but ultimately arable and development, it, it doesn't mix very well. And with the wealth of the desktop data that we had, which in this particular instance actually went back nearly 100 years, we were able to actually use that data in combination with our field data to demonstrate species decline, specifically in some flagship arable species, one of them being great partridge. And that has given us a driver to work with the local council, local biodiversity partnership groups and local farmers to try and deliver a more extensive mitigation program as a result of the development that extends beyond the development footprint and hopefully will work towards species recovery. And then it also helps us in terms of decision making. So we quite often get involved in high level option studies. Again, quite frequently at the early stage, it's all desktop based. So having, having that accessible data, allows early decisions and a refinement process in those options appraisals and, and having that accessibility. So this is, this is all um, aside from your, your standard site ecological impact assessment desktop. We use local record centres all the time and I have to say the service we get from the vast majority of them is brilliant. The data we've been getting back is getting better and better and I do have to reiterate maps, maps. <laughs> All, it's all spatial data now. So, um, but this is, this is um, just a very quick insight into other ways and other uses that we actually use desktop data for. 
So in terms of being the end user, how can consultants actually feed back into that process? Um, tip of the iceberg, we as, as licensed surveyors, it's now an obligation under our licenses, we have to send those species records back into the local centres. Um, but there's loads of other opportunities. Um, there's always the standard argument about, about data protection. But actually, the majority of data being collected by consultants is going to end up in the public domain. So it may just be a question of waiting, or it may be a question of just pre-warning the client that it's going to go, doesn't, you know. But it's very rare that a client will actually say, no, absolutely, I don't want my data to go anywhere. And that's usually when they're just looking at options on land. Um, a lot of uh, technology now hopefully means greater compatibility with the data that consultants are bringing in and the way data is stored with record centres. We often go to places, that, probably places people don't want to go, but, <laughs> but we often go to places that might be previously inaccessible. Um, quite a lot of our ecologists are keen photographers, so we can get quite good photographs as well, which I believe is something that's keen. Um, so there are lots of opportunities out there. and just want to throw in there, possibly, is there any opportunity for commercial data partnerships? We get data from you, we give data back. We have actually had this on a number of big landscape scale project based, but is there something that might be possible either on a regional basis or on a national basis with MBN? So something to consider. So anyway, thank you.